Okay, well, we've been talking about contradictions in the Gospels. A lot of people think that the Gospels and the Bible as a whole just are filled with all kinds of contradictions that just can't even make sense. So we've been looking at them. And uh, so we've made it through most of Matthew, and we are in Matthew 22:39. And uh, 22:39, Jesus is talking to this person, and he says, you know, about... He's there talking about which is the greatest commandment, and Jesus says, you know, the, the two are love Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then he says, you shall love your neighbor um, as yourself. Are you about to say something, Isaiah? No. Okay. Um, and uh, so this is um, one of those where people kind of twist it when they say that there's a contradiction here because, I mean, the idea is this. How can you, how can you love someone else if you're trying to love yourself? Because isn't love by see what I mean? So you'd be teaching, telling people to love themselves, but if you're loving other people, how can you love yourself? See what I mean? And so you, a lot of times people just kind of make something here that isn't. And I feel like part of it is because of some modern issues. So some people say that you have to learn to love yourself to love others. And so then they say that this ver they kind of twist it and say that this verse is saying learn to love yourself so you can love your neighbor and that's I don't really think what what Jesus is getting at um, Jesus is more talking about how we live so when I was a kid I kind of hated myself I wished I was someone else all the time and um, it's one of those things where I just wasn't really comfortable with myself and I would have said if you would have asked me at that point in my life I would have said that I hated myself. See what I mean? And I don't think that that's what Jesus is talking about here. I think it's how I feel versus how I act. So I might feel, you know, like I'm not a big fan of myself or my life or whatnot. But I act in a way that is naturally self-focused. You know what I mean? Like, um, I, nobody has to tell me to watch out for myself. I, I, I do. I, I. It's easy to, you know... Um, make your life revolve around yourself and around doing the things that you want, the things that make you feel better. It's a lot harder to live your life for other people. And I think that's just what Jesus is talking about, that natural tendency that we have to um, make our lives all about us. So in that same way that we already are looking out for number one, um, love your neighbor as you wish people would watch out for you kind of. Does that kind of make sense? Right. And so you're right. And you could say, you could even say it like that. Jesus did say it like that. And, uh, I, I think that that's more of what he's talking about, you know. When the, the people just kind of get a little bit lost in the psychology of today and kind of overlook what Jesus is saying. So, the greatest commandment is to love God, and second to that is to love your neighbor. So it's it's something that we do. We 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 live our lives for God. We're we're serving people, um, and you know I was gonna say this whole long spiel about. Um, you know, loving yourself and all these different things. And I just don't really think that it's that complicated. Um, it shouldn't be complicated. It shouldn't be complicated. And, uh, but people kind of get wrapped up in this. They kind of get sidetracked with it. Um, and, so, yeah. So, yeah. So maybe that would be a good thing to talk about some other time. But to stay on point with contradictions in the Bible, there is no contradiction here. It's more of just our own um, misunderstanding of what's going on there. Um, but I will say, though, um, we can learn how to see ourselves in the right light by reading scripture and by, you know, kind of, you know, going to God and praying and that kind of stuff. We can kind of get to a point where we don't hate ourselves, but we don't have to be in love with ourselves either. And I think that um, as we draw closer to God, we kind of um, have an easier time finding that balance. Um, so anyways, now on to some actual contradictions. Matthew 23, 9, 9 through 10 says, And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither uh, be called instructor, for you have one instructor, the Christ. So this kind of seems to be a contradiction because elsewhere it's, it says, you know, on your mother and your father and, and the law, for instance. Um, or when Paul talks to Timothy and he talks about, talks, uh, or I'm sorry, when Paul wrote in the book of Timothy and he talks about how he's a father to Timothy. So it kind of seems like there's this kind of obvious contradiction there between, well, I thought we weren't supposed to call someone father. And the issue here is that he's not talking about the title father. He's talking about a spiritual master. And in this context, Father is more is more talking about a, a, a spiritual um, master in your life. So you could say like, and call no man your your your, your master on earth. Your your um, the one that you draw strength from, the one that you um, um, kind of worship. For you have only one, and he's in he's in heaven. So it's not really talking about the title, not calling someone the words father. And this is 
where translations kind of make it harder because you try and translate and a lot of times when, when people are translating they try and make it as precise as possible but the problem is, is that there's no such thing as precise um, words don't have a literal meaning they have a semantic range a semantic range is that means that any word in any language has a range of meaning of what it can mean any word um, run I run a business. I run outside. I see what I mean? So what does run literally mean? Well, it doesn't literally mean anything. It has a semantic range. And the same thing is true here for this verse. You can't just translate it as father, even though that's the quote-unquote literal meaning. Be, because... Definition. Right. Right. Think about definition in, in this day right. and age and how people to define things too heavily and put right. like, place on the word and like do, do yes. say it's this. And I'm like, well, you really have to think about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and see, so that's our, the original audience would have understood what's being said in Matthew, but nowadays people just kind of like they, they they lose sight of the forest for the trees, and so they kind of miss that, and so looking for okay, so I don't call anybody my father. And it's like, well, no, you can call your dad dad. That's that's fine. <laughs> um, okay, what else? Um, so the uh, the big point here is that there shouldn't be um, people on earth that you unquestionably obey. There should be you should show proper respect to leaders and elders and, and, and parents and those kinds of things, but that doesn't mean you should have unquestionable obedience to them. See what I mean? Like there's gonna be a lot of times when maybe a government will, will ask you to do things that are not right for you to do. Um, and that's kind of what, what Jesus is getting at here. Matthew twenty three, thirty four through thirty five. Therefore I send the prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of uh, righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. So here it seems like there's a contradiction because he says that Zechariah is the son of Berechiah. Well, if you read in St. Chronicles 24, 20-22, it says that he was the son of Jehoiada, not the son of Berechiah. And so, ah, contradiction. Well, here's the thing. Jesus is probably not talking about the Zechariah from the book of St. Chronicles. He's probably talking about the prophet Zechariah from the book Zechariah. And they both died in very similar ways. So it's easy to see how someone could make the mistake of thinking that Jesus is talking about that Zechariah. But Zechariah was a very common name, <laughs> crazy common name. Um, especially uh, Hebrews, he, he, the, the, the Jewish people had a lot of names that were kind of like family names, and they were just kind of, you see them appear over and over again. It shouldn't make you think that it's the same person. That, that definitely shouldn't make you think that. Um, they were real big on, you know, um, like for instance, when... Um, uh, John the Baptist's dad goes to goes to say what his name is. The, all the family is like trying to argue with him. No, you don't want to name your kid John because that's not a family name, you know. And so then, you know, he said uh, he, they're all arguing with his wife, and he writes it down because he can't talk at that point. He says the name is John, and they're all like ah, and and that's kind of why that's such an issue for them is because they had like a lot of family names. So Zechariah it was a very common name uh, for the Jewish people. And so it's not Jesus making a mistake. This is not a contradiction. This is just simply we're talking about two different Zacharias. Didn't the apostles have, like, given names? Not all of their names are actually, like, John and Matthew and such. They actually had, like, names that were, like, given to them, like, as apostle names. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, Peter was one. His name was Simon. And yeah. Jesus named him Peter. Yeah, his, that's um, why he was called, like, Peter Simon. Right. right okay. uh, and then uh, some of them kept their same their birth names, uh, and then other ones had multiple names um, that they were known in different areas. So we don't really do too much of that nowadays. <laughs> but back then it was, you know, fairly common for people to be known by a couple different names. So anyways, uh, good question, though. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Matthew 24, 29, uh, verses... Uh, Luke 21, 20, uh, 24, and 27. So it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the, heaven, uh, of, of the heavens will be shaken. So notice how it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So now let's go over to Luke. It says, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So the question being, this seems like we have two different prophecies, but 
you know what I mean? It sounds like it's kind of contradicting itself in, in that it sounds like Matthew is saying that Jesus said um, it's going to happen right after the tribulation. But then Luke said, but there's going to be this time of the Gentiles. So it's kind of like, oh, well, what is he talking about? Well, he, they're actually both talking about the same event. They're just wording it slightly different. So let me kind of explain what I mean. So Matthew says that Jesus' coming is right after the tribulation. Luke separates it by the time of the Gentiles. Okay, I already said that. Um, in Matthew, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. The tribulation of those days that Matthew is talking about is the time of the Gentiles. When The time of the Gentiles, we're in the time of the Gentiles right now. And during that time, it was that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. It was at that time that um, you know Israel lost their, their nationhood, um, and it wasn't really um, restored to them until World War II, which is what made it such a big, um, actually the act right after World War II is what made it such a historic event. Um, and uh, so there's not, not really a contradiction here. Um, the judgment of Israel was the beginning of the time of the Gentiles, which which started um, at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. So right after Jesus um, left, the church was started. Jesus w went up into heaven in the 30s. From the 30s to the 70s, the church was growing, but it wasn't overly widespread, um, just kind of in the area. Well, when when uh, when the emperor died, I forget which emperor it was, um, one of the uh, Roman uh, g um, generals that was fighting the Jews actually went back. And so it was this kind of lull in the war and everything. That was around the 70s. And um, so when that was going on, that was when the, when the time of the Gentiles started. And uh, so they're both talking about the same event. The, the difference being that Luke specifies that it's the time of the Gentiles that is the um, tribulation of those days. And Matthew just calls it the tribulation of those days and moves on. Not really a contradiction. Matthew 24, 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Well, that definitely sounds like a contradiction because that generation is dead. They're dead. <laughs> Here we are. Still hasn't happened. So it definitely does sound like a contradiction. So there are actually a lot of different possible solutions to this. Um, and so I'm going to say all of them, and then I'm going to tell you which one I think is most likely. But you can come up with if if you disagree with me, that's fine. You can you know take your own stake on it. Like a lot of things, the problem isn't in what Jesus said, but in how it's translated into English. First, the generation that is alive when the tribulation begins will not die before it is concluded. So, in other words, the Book of Daniel talks about the seven years um, of, of the end and all this different stuff. In which case, obviously, seven years. That's not, you know, a seven-year period. That generation will still be alive. So the most obvious um, solution is that Jesus is talking about this generation that I'm talking about. That when the time, when the thing happens, that generation will not pass away before it before it all finishes. In other words, the start and the end of it is going to be a very short amount of time. So I mean, that definitely could be. Um, another uh, solution, which I think is probably the weakest solution, is that Jesus is only referring to the tribulation that is coming to Israel in 70 AD, in which case um, the destruction of Israel as a nation. So this generation that I'm talking to right now, you all will not die before um, Jerusalem is destroyed and your nation is, is destroyed. I, I don't really think that that's very that that's going to be the one because um, he's he in the rest of what he's talking about, he's he's talking about things that are happening at the end not things that happened then. So it seems like unless he's just like saying, I'm seeing all these different things of what's happening now and way far in the future, and now about the generation, that's just, just about this thing over here, that that generation won't die. And it's like, I, I, don't, I don't know, that doesn't really seem to make any sense. Um, uh, Another uh, solution, which is more likely than that solution, but I still don't think it's overly likely, is that it wouldn't begin to come to pass. With Let me say that differently. So this generation isn't going to pass away until all these things begin to take place. So in other words, the end will begin before this generation dies, which it, it could be translated as that. I guess it's more likely than saying that you know, the whole thing about he was only talking about the thing in 70 AD, but it just doesn't really make sense. Um, you think he's talking about the tribulation? It, it, seems, it seems like he's talking about the end times, and so for him to just hop around like that it just doesn't really fit. Another, another possible meaning is that Israel will, will be preserved as a race, so Israel, the Israelites won't die off. 
um, throughout the great t period of the Great Tribulation. There's this theory that possibly um, the the end was supposed to come at that point, but because they didn't um, they didn't believe they weren't producing fruit, God took the the coming of the kingdom from that generation and gave it to a future generation, or took it from the Israelites and gave it to the Gentiles or whatever. Um, I I kind of think that that that, that view is a little bit bogus. Um, See, in this one it says, Truly I tell you, this generation, the whole multitude of people living at the same time, in a definite, given period, will not pass away till all these things taken together, or taken together take place. Right, and so uh, I, should, I should explain that. Um, so the Amplified Bible, what it does is it doesn't, it's not a translation, it is yeah. an, an, kind of like an interpretation. So what it does is it will try and expand on what's being said in a way to help you understand but the problem is like right but the problem is is that it doesn't really go on what what the manuscript says but rather what they feel it is trying to say um so you know th the problem is is what is, what is Jesus trying to say is he trying to say like like that the people who did the amplified are are, are saying right. are they, is he trying to say that Jesus is for sure talking about the the people living at that time, that generation, or is he talking about like those other ideas that I was was talking about? And I gave you guys like five different five different views, and I told you which ones I thought weren't didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and but I, I, I included all five or four, however many I said, um, for the sake of that that you guys could, you know. Kind of draw your own conclusions because I'm not trying to make up your mind for you. Yeah, you know I go back and forth on this one, but um, so there's there's a couple different solutions. We might come back to it again um, in the future and, and talk about it a little more. But I just wanted to give you the the main options that are out there. Yeah, um, and I definitely do have some some resources for you guys. So Matthew 26:11 says, "For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me." This sounds like a contradiction because he says at the end of Matthew, he says, I am always with you even to the end of the age. So then we have here, he's saying, but you will not always have me. So it's like, well, which one? Will we always have Jesus or won't we always have Jesus? And the answer, excuse me, the answer is that he is talking about, uh, excuse me, he is talking about physically we will not always have him. He will not always be physically present with us here. But at the end of Matthew, he's talking about spiritually. I will be with you spiritually always, even to the end of the age. And I mean, that's how we still talk about it, too. You know, Jesus is with us. Well, not physically. I'm not like, he's not like sitting here on the couch with me, but he's with us. You know, you kind of make sense? And that's the same thing that, that that's being said here. Remember, both of those occurrences happen in the same part, by the same author in the same book. He obviously wouldn't have written, written something that contradicted himself, you know. And I think this is an important point because um, there are some there are some different cults and different things that teach that Jesus is not literally physically coming back again. Um, and one of the problems that we have with that is like what he says here about you know physically I will not be with you, but then um, also when he descends physically, I mean sorry ascends physically up into heaven, the angels clearly say that he will come in the exact same way. And then Jesus talked about how he would be coming back, and he's talking about a physical occurrence of him coming back. So that just doesn't really make sense. Like, um, what? Like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe that. Uh, he's Back right, that, that's one. Oh, that's one group that doesn't. Yeah. Okay, so then the last one I have for tonight, Matthew twenty six thirty four verses Mark fourteen thirty. It says in Matthew, Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Okay. Now we get to Mark fourteen thirty. It says, And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Now there's two possible solutions to this. The first one, neither Matthew nor John say how many times the rooster crowed. It simply says that the rooster did crow. So, um, that, that's, one, that's the most obvious solution right there. Um, you know, that we just, Matthew and John don't say how many times the rooster crows at all. So, um, it could be that, you know, it's, it, it, you know, there's that. And also, no, we'll, we'll wait to get back to that. We'll wait, to, yeah, we'll, we'll, wait to, we'll wait to look at that. So the first, the first obvious solution is that Matthew and John both don't say how many times the rooster crowed. But the second solution, which is something that is a, sometimes people have a little bit of a problem with, um, it is possibly a copyist error. Okay, now what this means, and we talked about this a lot with the Bill Mounts classes and stuff, 
there we don't have any of the original manuscripts okay they're all copies well in the earliest manuscripts we have of mark not not i shouldn't say the earliest in some of the early manuscripts we have of mark it doesn't have the word two twice oh, it doesn't have the word twice and so then we have a lot of we have a lot of copies of mark that say twice but to uh, some of the early ones don't say twice so it's possible that it was just an, an, an error that they made when they were copying it and that would totally fit uh, it would totally make sense in which case mark would have originally read truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows you will deny me three times and the twice just wouldn't be there um, both both solutions are possible um, like we mentioned sometimes sometimes when people made copies their mistakes would be made um, but once again this isn't something that really should concern us that much because it really doesn't change much of anything. Doctrine has stayed the same. Everything's fine. So the problem is more on the translation. Any questions or comments before we wrap up for tonight? Couldn't that also be that, like how it was before, like when they said, "Oh, there was two women at the these at the gravesite. Oh, it was just Mary at the gravesite." You know, couldn't it be also like that where um, Jesus may have said twice, but uh, the person just said. The you know, yeah, I, yeah, that, that could have happened. Um, Matthew and John not really caring, and so they just said rooster crowing and not really specify, whereas Mark specified, hey, two times. Yeah. Yes, that could have happened. Another possibility, which we'll look at um, as we get there, but there is also a possibility that Peter didn't just deny three times. He denied about five to six times, uh -huh. and so three of those times happened before the rooster crowed, and then the rooster crowed, and he denied a couple more times, and then the rooster crowed again. Um, that that's possible. Um, yeah. It really just depends on. We'll we'll look at that in a couple weeks, probably in two, two weeks. So.